<laughs> so uh, I think it's time to get started. So next we have three slightly shorter talks. Uh, and the first one is by Shi Chen from the University of Tokyo. And I'm very happy to say he's going to be coming here in the fall uh, to join the collaboration at the stuff. Uh, so Shi, go ahead. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Yeah, it's really nice to meet you guys here. Uh, yeah, I. Okay, so my name is just the Shi, forget about the family name. Uh, and uh, yeah, I come from the University of Tokyo, Japan. Uh, yeah, and it's really nice to be here to uh, join this uh, uh, some collaboration conference to talk about some topics related to the uh, confinement physics. Uh, yeah, my uh, research is in collaboration with Yuya. Uh, so Yuya is also there. Uh, he will give another talk, yeah, like two days later, I guess. Uh, and uh, yeah, because I'm now suffering from the jet lag. So if I say something too stupid, please correct me, Yuya. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, so yeah, from this title, uh, you may think that my talk might be a little bit off the topic because I'm going to talk about the generalized symmetry. Yeah, but uh, yeah, actually this is uh, also close to related to the uh, confinement physics because we know that uh, the one from some tree is very important to understand confinement. And uh, we know that confinement is a very non perturbative phenomenon. So in order to understand it, we have to look at the mathematical structure of non perturbative uh, quantum field theories, which is very tough. Uh, and uh, then in this case, generalized symmetry provides us a very uh, important tool to understand the infrared physics. Uh, because, for example, we can look at the Hooft anomaly uh, and also we can look at the uh, selection rules predicted by the uh, general symmetry. And also we can consider its spontaneous breaking. Uh, all of these constraints uh, uh, infrared physics. Uh, so in that sense, uh, general symmetry uh, is also important for uh, any non perturbative phenomena, including confinements. Uh, yeah, for example, just as I just mentioned, uh, the Confinement is very uh, is tightly related to the higher form symmetry. Uh, we know that we can characterize confinement uh, by some one form symmetry. For example, if we know that the center symmetry of a uh, Yamil theory uh, is not spontaneous broken, and then we can see that oh, we have some confinement phase here. And uh, similarly, on the Buell side, if we see some uh, magnetic uh, higher form symmetry, if it's all, uh, if it's spontaneous broken, and then we see that we have uh, uh, confinement here. So this is somehow a dual description. So uh, in this sense, uh, as I, uh, because I assume, I assume that you are, you guys are very familiar with uh, higher form symmetry. So, uh, but also let me uh, slightly introduce what is higher form symmetry. Uh, for the ordinary symmetry, uh, the uh, generating operator for this symmetry is a co-dimensional one uh, topological operator. Uh, but if we look at higher co-dimensional uh, topological operator, then we can create a uh, so-called higher form symmetry. Uh, so it's typically called a P-form symmetry for co-dimension P plus one topological operator. Uh, and um, the important center symmetry in confinement physics is uh, uh, one form symmetry, which means that the, uh, its topological operator has co-dimension two. Uh, so this is uh, what we are familiar with. And uh, but actually, the allowing different dimensions is just the beginning uh, to get generalized symmetry. We can also generalize symmetry in many, many other ways. Uh, here, I present two important ways. Yes, the first way uh, is to consider the interaction between different dimensions. I mean, for example, if we have some uh, co dimension P uh, topological operators. Uh, if we connect them together to make some uh, to make a web, then on the junction, uh, we can have some uh, higher co-dimensional uh, topological operator. So in this case, the topological operators in different co-dimensions will interact with each other, and to make up a more complicated uh, uh, algebraic structure. So in this case, this kind of symmetry is typically called a higher group symmetry. So for higher group symmetry, uh, we cannot simply talk about, uh, for example, one form, two form, three form. Uh, this is not so good because they somehow mix together with each other. So we have to regard them as a whole. 
uh, this is one of the important generalizations. Uh, the second generalization, uh, which is called a non-invertible symmetry. Uh, in this case, uh, we know that typically uh, we believe that the uh, symmetry action is invertible, which means that we have to use a group to describe the symmetry. Yeah, but uh, recently people realized that in some cases, uh, this might not be true. Uh, we might have some non-invertible symmetry action. So in this case, uh, we cannot use a group to describe the symmetry, but we have to use some other more complicated objects. So in this case, uh, we have the non-invertible symmetry. Okay, so uh, since we already know that the high, form, uh, the high form symmetry is already important enough to uh, constrain the infrared physics, uh, this is also the case for higher group symmetry and the non-invertible symmetry. Uh, so uh, people found many examples with higher group symmetry or non-invertible symmetry. And the people use them to constrain the uh, infrared physics to find a lot of interesting uh, phenomena. And um, this is the background. And uh, in this talk, I and Yuya, uh, we found some interesting connections uh, between different kinds of generalized symmetries. And uh, uh, so here I'm going to give an introduction of our funding. Uh, and uh, the key of our funding is something called the solitonic symmetry. Uh, the name might be not so uh, familiar, but uh, yeah, it's actually uh, some very uh, classical object. Yeah, in short, the solitonic symmetry is uh, generated by topological functionals and it acts on defect operators and it tells as the selection rule of solitonic excitations. I mean, the excitation, which can be regarded as solitons. Uh, so yeah, here I give two uh, simple example. Yeah, we can consider the uh, compactified boson. And in this case, because the, uh, the, target, uh, the target space of the path integral is uh, the loop S1. So we have a non-trivial uh, homotopy group pi one. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, an according sonitonic symmetry, which is D minus two form. Uh, and um, its uh, generating operator is given by this kind of expression. Uh, it's not a defect, but a functional. Uh, so we call it a topological functional. And its charged operator are given by some defects, uh, depending on the uh, space-time dimension. We have different uh, defects. And uh, when we try to evaluate this kind of expectation value of defects, and uh, we will find that uh, inside this loop, for example, or between these two dots, uh, the classical solid configuration will appear uh, to give a contribution uh, so that we can get, for example, this kind of area law, uh, or if we do not have a potential, we just have the conformal behavior. So uh, this is a typical example for the solitonic symmetry. Another familiar example is the Maxwell theory. Uh, in the Maxwell theory, uh, I mean, U1 gauge theory, uh, we have this kind of homotopy group, pi two of the classifying space of U1. Uh, I denote it as BU1. And uh, in this case, we can uh, similarly construct this kind of solitonic symmetry. And uh, the charged objects uh, are at hoofed uh, points or at hoofed lines. Uh, so I guess this is also another familiar example. Uh, so the, I and you have found that uh, the solitonic symmetry. Uh, might be a very interesting tool for us to understand more general generalized symmetry. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, okay. So in this case, for example, yeah, let's consider the uh, uh, yeah space time uh, three D uh, space time dimension, and in this case. Uh, this is like the monopole, monopole defect. Yeah, yeah, and in this case, this is like also the monopole defect, but because of the space-time dimension, so it's now a line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can call it a, the water line of monopole. Yeah. So if we increase the space-time dimension, we will have like a surface and so on. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, according to the previous slide, uh, we find that uh, 
the D minus P minus one forms on the symmetry uh, is given by the punctuation duo of the according uh, homotopy group, pi P. Uh, and uh, this leads us to ask a question. So because the pi P uh, might not be comm uh, commutative if P equals one. Uh, in this case, the punctuation duo of this pi one is not, uh, how do you say, informative enough. Yeah, well, if we know the punctuation duo of pi one, we may not reconstruct the pi one itself. So we lost, we lose some information. Uh, so the question is then what is the correct symmetry to describe this situation? Uh, and then we have to think about uh, the, some, some, some subtlety uh, in understanding this situation. That is because we have a difference between the free homotopy and the based homotopy, uh, which means the, uh, how do you say, the uh, deformation class of maps from a S1 to our target space. Uh, this set is different from pi one uh, because pi one is defined as the based homotopy of pointed maps. So uh, if we take this kind of difference into account, we will find that Actually, the real uh, set of deformation classes of this map uh, is classified by the conjugacy classes of this pi one. So uh, as long as we know this fact and we can try to construct the symmetry operators uh, for this case, and then we'll find that uh, the topological functionals on S1 uh, must be spanned by the characters of irreducible unitary representations of this pi one. And uh, the fusion, uh, the, how do you say, something like the group multiplication is given by the tensor product of the representation uh, because this kind of uh, relation of the characters. And uh, because we now have representations of dimension higher than one. So this kind of uh, fusion rule might be non invertible uh, this comes from the non-commutativity of the pi one group. And uh, so in general, the D minus two form symmetry, uh, D minus two form solitonic symmetry is given by the uh, Tanaka duo of this pi one. Uh, this is a mathematical name. So it's algebraic structure is described by a symmetric tensor category instead of just a simple group. Uh, so uh, this is the case for the, uh, pi one for the D minus two uh, solitonic symmetry. And we can understand this story. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can, we can consider the, all the representations, all the finite dimensional uh, representations of this pi one, and uh, they have some relations. For example, we can add them together, or we can tensor them together. So in such a way, the form somehow uh, some, some uh, algebraic structure. And uh, that algebraic structure is called the Tanaka duo of this uh, pi one, and we, which is a tensor category. Uh, so it is far more complicated than groups. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, let's discuss it later. <laughs> yeah, so the key point is that this is a non-invertible symmetry. It's not a group because for in group, we must have invertible elements. Yeah, so this, this, this is a key point. Yeah, so, and then uh, we can understand this. Uh, actually, the, the story I just told now, this is not some new story. This is uh, some well-known story. And uh, uh, we can understand this story by this kind of construction. Yeah, we can consider another quantum field theory with a target space as a universal cover of uh, the original target space. And in this case, uh, in this new theory, the pi one uh, is actually a zero form symmetry in this new theory. Uh, then we can obtain our original theory by gauging this pi one symmetry. Uh, so, which means that we can have this kind of relation. Uh, we gauge a zero form non-commutative symmetry, and then we get a D minus two form non-invertible symmetry. So this is a, uh, relation, uh, uh, somehow we can call it a somehow a duality relation. And at the mathematical level, we start from a group and on the dual side, we have the 
solitonic symmetry of its classifying space. Uh, and uh, I and Yuya want to generalize this relationship to higher dimensional solitonic symmetries. And uh, so in this case, uh, we must know some uh, deeper mathematics. That is every topological space uh, is related to a higher group called its fundamental infinity group. Uh, yeah, roughly speaking, uh, in this kind of complicated structure, yeah, we uh, take or how do you say? Uh, it includes all the information of all of its. Uh, I'm sorry because the time is running out. So can I just? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, let me be brief. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this fundamental infinite group is uh, how do you say vast generalization of the fundamental group. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, each uh, topological space uh, can be realized as a twisted product of uh, this kind of classifying spaces of the homotopy groups. So this is called a post tower. tower. Uh, okay, so in such a way, uh, this result is called the homotopy hypothesis, which means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the uh, higher groups and uh, the homotopy type of topological spaces. Uh, so as long as we know this fact, we can uh, establish, uh, we can generalize uh, the, the, that, that classical result, uh, which means that if we gauge a non-abelian invertible symmetry, we will obtain an abelian non-invertible symmetry. Here, abelian means commutativity plus factorizability. Uh, as I mentioned, that in higher group symmetry, uh, different from uh, the topological operators of different dimensions mix with each other. Uh, then that is called the uh, unfactorizable. Uh, so fact by factorizable, I mean, uh, we can decompose the symmetry into each forms. Uh, so this is the new duality I and Yuya want to uh, study. And at the mathematical level, yeah, this is, uh, is the same. We found the duality between higher group and uh, some solitary symmetry of a topological space. So, okay, this is my last slide. <laughs> so uh, in short, yeah, I and Yuya uh, want to establish the Tanaka duality uh, between non-abelian uh, invertible symmetry and abelian non-invertible symmetry. And uh, then we propose that uh, every abelian non-invertible symmetry can be realized by the solitonic symmetry of a proper topological space. And uh, we also find that the solitonic symmetry generalized in this way is a very good cohomology theory uh, for mathematicians because uh, as long as uh, two topological space have the same solitonic symmetry uh, in all dimensions, then we can see that these two topological spaces are uh, homotopy equivalent to each other. Okay, so this is all about my talk. So I'm sorry that I <laughs> take a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, if you gauge a discrete non-abelian space, then those can move associated with the state. Is that an analogy? Oh, yes, I think this is a classical case. Yeah, so we want to. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. So, so this slide, I'm going to use my position slide in that. Is this just for discrete symmetry? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm discrete. Discrete. yeah, yeah. So for this. Saying that there is obviously an invertible symmetry in Yango. Yes, you are If you have the same coupling, it's actually zero. Well, and then the then, connections are flat. But then, but then it's, yeah, sure. If it's flat connections, then. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, you can consider that. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I have to add discrete here. <laughs> uh, or we can just couple the flat uh, gauge field. Yeah, that's also possible. Yeah. Ah, uh, examples. Yes, I can give some examples, but if is the time okay? So maybe. We'll we'll have a like a chunk of time after the three shorter <laughs> talks for more discussion. So maybe let's go on to the next talk and then 
swing back to this. That's okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Is it okay, Emily? Uh, all right. So okay. let's uh, let's thank she. Thank you very much.